Hi guys, welcome to another Toy Guys Talking. It is my pleasure to have the lovely and talented Steve Glosson from Geek Out Loud Podcast. Steve, I have heard you a number of times as a guest on Rebel Force Radio. And yeah. uh, it's awesome to have you on. We're going to talk about Star Wars and all sorts of other toys as well. How are you doing tonight? I'm, I am down with it, man. I, I am. I have learned to love your stuff. It didn't take me long. Um, and and so watching you and and just getting to see the glimpses. I love the glimpses of the '80s toy museum we get. And and you've just figured out. Here's what I love. And and let me just do what everyone does. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what I love about you first and foremost. Here's what I love. Please, please <laughs> stop. You're making me blush. <laughs> what, what I love <laughs> is, is there are so many toy channels on YouTube when, when even talking vintage toys and 80s toys and stuff that uh, here's this in the package and here's this on the shelf and here's this. But, but you put the things on the Lazy Susan, you're spinning them around, you're giving us full 360s. You're you're taking them out into the wild. I actually you're call playing. it the lazy Raul. Oh, the lazy Raul. <laughs> <laughs> but you're playing. Don't, with don't read cool. into that. It's just my go-to name for everything. That's fine. <laughs> I Raul. also have things called the exceptional Raul. So. Ex yes, yeah, the lethargic <laughs> Raul. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but no, you're you're playing with toys, and and it's and it's that thing where you found a way to do it that makes sense it's not you know I, I just love it i love the time and energy you, there's so much effort that goes into what you do and and because we're watching it on this side of the screen i think a lot of times people forget what what it takes to throw in the sound effects to find the clips to the cartoons to to do and and you just do it effortlessly and and wonderfully and and i just i love watching your stuff it's good times oh, i appreciate so, that and it takes me back and i love your positivity that was what geek out loud was born to be back in the day was just positivity i it was in a t of course granted give me 2009 type positivity you know negativity again these days but yeah. you know it was it was a time where people were like just complaining about everything i guess it was more 2007 but i was like i want to just get on and celebrate what i love yeah and, that's and what it's so, all about and, and and so that's that's how that show came to be and and this just like you you do that, and that's what I that's what I absolutely enjoy. So I'm excited to be doing this with you. It it, it is an honor, and it's and it's great to be here. Oh, I appreciate it, and that is just so humbling and flattering to me because I've heard you so many times um, on uh, on Rebel Force Radio, mm. and it's such a, such an honor to have you on here and chat with you, and and the same with Jason Swank and and hearing uh, Jason uh, have the same thoughts too and i just think wow like i i didn't even send you guys my stuff i, right. I wasn't like hey guys i love your stuff <laughs> check out what i'm doing i mean i just you know i was doing my thing i was right. doing me you guys are doing you and just the force has <laughs> brought right. us That's together right. and it's just crazy because it's it's like a mutual admiration society which mm always has like a negative connotation to it. And I think we need that more than ever. I think people oh, for sure. need yeah. to have mutual admiration. Why not? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just love what you're doing too. And there is, um, there is a lot of complaining and, and my stuff was born out of, uh, I guess, a like a, an opposite knee jerk reflex to it. Mm. Cause I got into all this stuff cause I loved it. Right. And right. I, I would see people who would, um, you know, they, they say it's their passion, but they don't seem to be enjoying things. No, I mean, no. there's, there's always been movie critics who don't enjoy movies. And, <laughs> and, and then out of that was born music critics. We, right. we see them all on like American Idol, those music critics who just hate music, mm -hmm. right? They just like, yeah. they, they listen to the most powerful, beautiful performance and they go, that needs work. Right. And then toys too. Like I, I, I can uh, sometimes see videos of guys playing futzing as I call it mm -hmm. with like a 300, $400 toy. Yeah. This sucks. That sucks. I'm like, right. <clears throat> yeah. How does this, how does this happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's the mentality. It's the collector's mentality. But what's really interesting is, is there's still this attitude of, I need more, I need better. 
And, Mo, and I spell it M O A R more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's but, never going to be enough. But what's so amazing is is you couple that with a lot of those guys long for the old days at the same time. They want better, but they long for the old days. And so it, it's it, it's a it's a weird place to be. And so what I had to learn as a collector um, is to just collect what I love, collect what I enjoy, and just be just be willing to let the other stuff go. Not worry about being a completionist so much. Yeah. And and it made it and it brought the fun back to it because for a while there, it was buy a buy an action figure, put it in a tub, shove it in the closet. Buy an action figure, put it in the tub, right. shove it in the closet. You know. How much and then, sense does what, that make? It makes none, you know, because yeah. I buy these things to enjoy them. And so not to I hoard. Became, yeah. And that, that is the definition of hoarding. And I became an opener, you know, I became a, uh, I, there, there are some things that I think display better in the package. And so I'll leave them there. Right. Um, but, uh, but by and large, I just would open things and because it's so much better to have them in your hand, to feel, to, to experience that tactile experience that we always loved growing up, you know? And and then you get, yeah. then you do get to kind of play with them, and uh, and 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 put them out there on the shelves to display. They display easier when they're open, you know, whether it's an action figure or a or a vehicle. Um, yeah, so uh, so yeah, that's and that's and I guess I come back to that's what I love so much about your your channel because there are things that you have picked up um, that I, I I just wouldn't because I don't collect that line right now and. Not because I don't want to. It comes down to you have to make financial decisions sometimes. Yeah. And so so particularly some of the modern Transformers that you've been doing uh, reviews of lately, um, to see those things out of the package and see how they work. And I'm like, I really need to get back into Transformer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, they're so good. They're doing such a good job with most of them these days, it and, seems like. And the new – when I started doing these um, – I kind of had this attitude towards the masterpiece stuff where I, I wasn't going to do a walkthrough transformation. I just, I think one of my, um, early ones, it might've been, uh, gears, whatever, mm. whatever the third party gears was called grump, I think bad cube grump. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't transform them. <laughs> I just said, look, everyone, I know, <laughs> I know the, um, you know, the feces storm that I am creating here by not transforming this. And it's kind of funny that you can have 100% awareness and you can even like predict <laughs> uh, what's going to happen and tell the people how they're going to behave. Right. This is how you will behave in reaction to what and I'm about to do. 100% transparency. Here's what's going to happen. I'm not transforming it. I've seen the reviews, stress marks, breakage. Mm. This thing is a nightmare to transform. I ain't so good <laughs> with, with you know, <laughs> transforming this stuff. G1 gears, no problem. Right. Done. Yeah. This thing, no. I I don't think it's gonna happen. So I what I the message I wanted to get across was please just try to enjoy 75% of this review, you know, like but with mm. all or nothing mentality, all or nothing is all or nothing. You right. didn't transform it, this is garbage, you have right. a and you, you hear the silliest stuff, like you have a responsibility to do this and that, and and <laughs> it's just <laughs> Uh, yeah, Michael, you have a responsibility to play with your toys the way I expect you to play with your toys. Yeah. It, 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 it's ridiculous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have been doing the transformations more, and I've just – the way I got over that hurdle was just more research, more practice, and just more patience, time. Mm -hmm. Hey, if I'm going to transform this thing – I did one on the Hot Rod Hoodlum, Fans Toys yeah. Hoodlum. Yeah. It's like an hour long. <laughs> and when it was done, I looked at it and went – who's going to watch an hour of me trying to tra transform this thing? But it, people are, and, and yeah. they, and because it's not just, uh, how does this go? It's right. like, I'm, I'm, tr you know, I'm appreciating the whole process from beginning to end. It's not just screaming and swearing. It's like, Oh, look at, like I'm discovering just like mm -hmm. I did as a kid. I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. Recapture that joy right. that the right. original one brought. So even the most frustrating frustratingly designed transformer can still be that time warp because uh you know when we were growing up there were some g1 transformers that were a little um you know complicated of like maybe a parts former like omega supreme how does this work and how do yeah. the combiners go together yeah you learn you figure it out and the great thing about the video thing 
is that it's kind of like hanging out with your old friends and just figuring mm -hmm. it out as you go. People are watching and they might even be commenting, eh, turn the left arm up. What are you doing? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, with, with, with the G1, I remember, um, Jetfire was always a little tough for me. Of course, oh, I was a little kid. Because it wasn't a Transformer. It was a Robotech yeah. Macross. Yeah. And, oh. um, and the first Transformer I ever had, I received for Christmas, it was Megatron. Oh, that and, was one of the one, first ones I had, too. And he was a difficult transformation. Brutal. Brutal. You know, uh, especially when I, I believe I was... The Brut the, the Brutal Megatron to this had, day, actually. Yeah, the I, Megatron I, I had was a pre-rub. So what year would that have been? 84. Um, Okay, so it would have been eight. So I would have been, you know, seven years old, um, and and for a seven year old kid, you know, it was just like, no, wait, hold, what, uh, mm, you know, and yeah. so and the instructions was, aren't a step by step video. <laughs> <laughs> they're not. No, an arrow, a little swooshy arrow, and a in, <laughs> down. Is it any wonder why, like, the long, so many longtime fans just are like, <laughs> All right. well, Get and it. you know, I was. I was the I was the kid who took care of my toys to the best of my ability. I played with them, yeah. and so they had play wear and tear. And um, with Megatron, we were all playing. This was a time when kids used to play. We'd play war. I mean, you know, we'd and we'd all pick our weapons. And my best friend from up the street used Megatron as his weapon while we were playing war or army, whatever you want to call it, to lighten it up. Yeah. And um, and he jumped out of our climbing tree with Megatron in his pocket. And the plastic barrel snapped. Ah. Uh, so, I it, it it the. And that was not, was not that his or your Megatron? It was mine. It was mine. He felt awful. Like he he wasn't like. Yeah. He felt terrible. He came immediately to me and said, "Dude, this happened. I'm sorry." And it was just some of the connector tabs that had snapped off. You know. You want to hear something? Knowing funny? what I know today, um, I should have kept him and fixed him. Yeah. You know. Um, because we, I, fixing wasn't an option then though. Broken not, was the end. Right. But here's right. something funny. I had a Megatron too. When I was a kid, um, I was dreaming nightly of getting Optimus prime mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. a friend of the family said, you got a big surprise coming for your whatever birthday, Christmas side. I don't remember, mm -hmm. but it was, it was late that year. Uh, cause my birthday is around Christmas anyway. And I thought I was getting prime and I was so jonesed. I was jacked. I was like, Oh my God, I'm getting prime. And I opened this giant box and it's Megatron. Aren't you happy? Don't you love it? It's that big transformer you wanted. Thanks. But you already had Megatron, or they, you no, got Megatron? No, I had no. I had no Transformers, and I was. Well, see, when I, I was got Megatron, get, getting Megatron, but um, so I had Megatron. Woohoo! Yeah. Yay! I mean, I liked him, but I wanted Prime, so I right. traded a kid at school, not permanent, but just he had Prime, and he yeah. was tired of him. Right. I had Megatron, and I was like, I don't even care. <clears throat> and and this kid broke my Megatron, broke oh, the arm oh. right off. So I oh. I feel your pain, and and he gave it back to me. I'm like, oh. and I was so careful, right? And I'm like, I, when someone yeah. else breaks your fragile toy, yeah, that's brutal. We the the um, I I I was not aware of Transformers until I received Megatron for Christmas that year when I received him, and then, and I don't know, I don't know the timeline. I don't know the history. I just know that. It wasn't long after that that I did become very aware of the Transformers and, um, you know, watching them every day and that sort of thing. And so man, you, I, you took your first step into a larger world. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I wanted and I, too, wanted Optimus Prime so badly. My friend, my best friend from the road, he had Optimus Prime and he had Soundwave. Um, man, later first, on, those first Transformers toys were off the charts. Like they were, you had they were, a little tape deck, you had the truck. Yes. You had a gun, like it, mm -hmm. the scales were all over the place. Yep. But the toys were just, just incredible picks for that, that never, first year and, lineup. And I never questioned it though. And, and when the cartoon comes on, I never questioned the fact that Megatron turns into a gun and just shrinks down and is able to fit in, you know, Starscream's hand well, or that. Well, it's coping you know, skills. I, I right. think we have, we had the coping skills to just mm -hmm. go, okay, uh, yeah. roll with it. Just right. Literally yeah. roll with it. Right. Roll. Um, but, uh, so, but I always would have to have a stand in when I was playing by myself for Optimus Prime. And I used, this is weird, but I used my stuffed Wicket the Ewok. Um, what? <laughs> well, he was just, 
Yep, Look, nub I'll and you. roll out. <laughs> I, I don't know I, why. I think I Wicket just... ha is more of like an Omega Supreme looking guy. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, he's huge. He towers over them. The stuff Wicket towers over them, but that's just what I did. Yeah. But I was also very much a universe collider. Yeah. So I'd have G.I. Joe showing up on Tatooine. I would have, you know, He-Man showing up with the Transformers and you know, and then I would have them all teaming up. And one of my favorite things to do would be to take the various um, different vehicles or play sets and make bases out of them. So you'd have Castle Grayskull combined with um, the Millennium Falcon parked right next to it, you know, and uh, that kind of stuff. And like, this is our base. And, yeah. you know, I had the, um, the, the, the battle platform, the G.I. Joe battle platform that was, it's a uh, kind of a, Oil rig looking thing. The yeah, oil rig. Yeah, yeah, tactical yeah. Battle the platform. tactical platform. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. tactical platform. And so there, that would be there. And they would just, you know, and then on the other side, I'd have the Death Star. And, or really, I didn't have the Death Star at that point, but the Star Destroyer and, you know, um, whatever whatever other evil vehicles I had or play sets I had. And it was on, you know, like, it, here we go. And, and, and I had all these scenarios, how they could meet up. And, and I, and I would have Luke look at He-Man and be like, wow, you're really big. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you didn't just, because if I ever crossed over, I would just pretend they were the same, right? right? But you acknowledged, like, oh, yeah. oh, I have the power I, of Grayskull. <laughs> mm -hmm. I acknowledged it. Because in my mind, well, they come from this other dimension, place or dimension, Universe, so they're yeah. just bigger. Yeah. So that's how that's how I rolled. So they they talk about these ambitious crossovers. Uh, the Avengers, every Avengers movie is the most ambitious crossover right. in history. And all the kids from the 80s are like, hold my beer or hold my tea. Right. <laughs> like, right. Come on, man. I, I landed the Falcon on Castle Grayskull. <laughs> Let's see you do that. That was treacherous, that was a treacherous day. <laughs> you know, like Point Dread, forget it. The Falcon yeah. on Castle Grayskull's oh. Point Dread. <laughs> man, yeah, that, that was... There was that was that was a that was a worrisome time that day, uh, but yeah, the, the and and that's what was so great is, you know, and I don't I, I try never to be one of these old fogies that is like well you know back in my day yeah but I also recognize that there was there was a sweet spot of toys that that fired your imagination up it, and and gave you the tools to help broaden your imagination rather than doing all the work for you, if that makes yeah, sense. No, and absolutely. And, and, and it was, it was really just a great time to be a kid and, and to have, and, and I thought for the longest time that I was the only one as I got out of college and into adulthood and still had all of my GI Joes and transformers and especially all my star Wars things that I'd had as a kid. And I thought, well, all right, well, when I get into my own place, I'm going to take a room and I'm going to set up the room with all of this stuff on display. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was the only one. Well, here comes the Internet. And I'm like, I'm not the only one. Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> there are more of us out there. One of us. One of us. And, and we inspire each other, too. I mean, yeah. all of this would not exist if I hadn't seen... Um, the guiding lights <laughs> on, yes. on, on the internet. Like I right. may have put things the way I put them and other people wouldn't put them together in this particular combination of things together. That might be my personal choosing, but I got the idea from seeing other people fill up a whole room mm -hmm. and just that feeling that they get when they're in it. I mean, there, there aren't too many people who have a collection room a museum of their own and they stand there and they just stand there with their arms crossed and you know, they're, it's not making them happy. I mean, most of the people that I saw who were surrounded like Mr. James McInerney with his star Wars room, I yes. mean, that's, that's a magical place. You know, yes. that's his, that's not just his man cave or, you know, a place to chill. I mean, that's wonder and magic mm -hmm. joy. It's a time portal. And mm -hmm. it's a magical place. So it's a, that's exactly the type of thing that inspired me because going to the toy store wasn't really doing it for me anymore because uh, um, the characters were gone. You know, Prime mm -hmm. was gone. He-Man was gone. 
I've always made an effort to not be one of those old fogey style guys because right. I couldn't stand them when I was walking home from school and <laughs> they'd be sitting there and back in my day, everything was better. We didn't have stupid bicycles or, mm. you know, backpacks. We carried right. things, you know, we dragged them. And, and so, I, you know, we you had could, a strap. We'd put our books together <laughs> and just throw them over our shoulder. Yeah, hang it around my neck. <laughs> so, so and like I, you can learn just as much from people doing things the wrong way as you can from right. people doing things the right way. And that's an important lesson for a kid to learn that you don't just watch the masters and learn from the masters. You can learn from the screw ups and, and the idiots and the, the morons, the imbeciles, yeah. the, the miserable people. You can learn from them. Do the yeah. opposite. Yeah. I might have even learned from doing the opposite more than um, mimicking the, the right things. Mm. So I always uh try not to say you know the stuff out today sucks and you know things were better in my day all i can say is that i remember what i grew up on very vividly it was it was very vivid to me it was very special it was awesome and i've been keeping tabs on what things you know what's happening throughout the years it's not like i just shut down in 1989 and went well it's all downhill from here I was very enthusiastic about the 90s. There was Mm -hmm. some interesting stuff in that decade and the 2000s and even to this day. I still walk into my Toys R Us in my hometown and go, what are we going to see today? Who are we going to see today? I just saw Jetfire today from Siege. Oh, wow. That's awesome. He's a little out of my price range, but that's cool, man. I love it. It's so cool. So. I always want to say like, you know, enjoy what you enjoy and and Mm -hmm. you're growing up on this thing right now and let it be special to you. But I just hear from so many young people who didn't grow up in my generation and go, wow, I wish. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, that's, there are certain things I wish too, like music, musically speaking. I love eighties music, but sixties, seventies, I wish. You know, the classic rock, yeah. I wish. ACDC, CCR, Zeppelin, Skinner, I wish. Yeah. So I do it too with, with right. other things. Well, the great thing the great thing about music, though, is that it's so much more accessible mm-hmm. than, than the toy lines that we had. You know, you go on and try to find an Optimus Prime, even kind of a beater, you know, a, a G1 Optimus Prime, and it's... It's unattainable almost, you know, unless you're just, unless well, that's going to be your purchase for the year. Well, at the moment, he is at Walmart's, like right, that's North, true. North American wide. And there's, you know, that's another thing that a lot of people have um, complained about because the price was unacceptable. I feel like it was, <laughs> yeah, I feel like he was overpriced. It, for... it wasn't even high. It was, uh, let's say, unacceptable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they right. were, they, I think they were definitely taking advantage of the people who were going to have that warm, fuzzy feeling. Sure. And, and that's a real, I think that's a real shame. I, I can't see the licensing of that truck, that Freightliner. Mm. You know, sometimes the licensing of the real vehicle is going to, you know, jack the price up a little bit. But I think that was purely everyone's going to want them. And they're still, they're going to say it's still cheaper than getting a beater on eBay. That's true. That's true. And I think with, there's with just this something. Exception, though, if, if you've got a beater on eBay, at least you may have a trailer that comes with it. That's true. You yeah. know, and, the, and I was just I was really I was I was kind of let down at, at that as well as the hot rod that came out. That's a um, big that was a big shortcut. And like, it's cool to have them in the in the same size box because the mm-hmm. original Autobot cars from 84, there were 11 of them. Mm-hmm. So now there's a dozen. There's a baker's dozen. That's and, right. <laughs> and if you have the the 11 boxed ones, either originals or the KOs, the knockoffs, uh, which are I exact almost like exact replicas now you got nice 12 all together and it's cool to have prime in a box like that but the deal is in my opinion if uh, if you're going to do a prime by himself without a trailer you have to put out the trailer the following year mm-hmm. we, we can't milk this thing for three years and then say here's your trailer you can't do it and where's the trailer so like i'm you know, they need to put out the prime with the trailer and they need to change up the cab a little bit so that the people who bought the cab on its own don't feel ripped off. Right. So I'm thinking right. just just do um, either the New Year Convoy or um, Music Label Convoy. These were Japanese reissues. Yeah. He had a blue tinted windshield mm-hmm. and um, 
the music label like an iPod playing uh, Optimus Prime in Japan. He had a different head, more oh, tune wow. accurate head, and he could look up and down. It was on a ball joint. Oh, Just wow. give us these little tiny tweaks so that the people who bought the single one still feel like, you know what, cool. This yeah. the, the yeah. Bo uh, single box one without the trailer. That's a replica, very close replica of the '84 with mm -hmm. uh, yellow eyes, clear windows. And then if you want the, the blue windshield and stuff, then you get the trailer and, you know, it, it's a little easier to take than yeah. I dropped 70, you know, in Canada, it's 70 right. in the States, oh, wow. it's 50, yeah. uh, you know, and then a hundred, it'll probably be. Uh, right. And, and it just, it, it seems, you know, and, and, and that's where you don't, you got to be careful because you don't want to slide into the complaining aspect. But it yeah. really does. It you the word unacceptable is a great word there. I, I I do think that that's kind of a an unacceptable thing, especially when I remember paying thirty dollars for the Power Master Optimus Prime. In, well, that was I, a long time ago, though. I know, it was, I know it was, but but that was that was a piece that I personally went to Walmart in in the little town that my family had moved to. And put that bad boy on layaway and cut grass for three weeks, $10 a cut yeah. to go and get that guy out of there. And so he was, I think he was probably, he was a little over 30, I believe the price point in the States. And so, but he was the, he was the first and really the only transformer I ended up buying as a child with my own money because he came out kind of late in the. In the Transformers runs, but man, I was so happy to have a Prime. Yeah, when I got him, he was one of my favorite toys ever. I it me never too. it never occurred to me that like, oh yeah, he could use a little bit more articulation here in the arms or the head or the or the uh, and when he gets into the big robot mode, you know. Oh, so he's just doing this number here, you know, just. <laughs> but he had I so much him. cool stuff going on though. Like yeah. I I was fully aware of his shortcomings and. The U.S. release had a lot less going on than the Japanese one did. The mm -hmm. Japanese one had like clear blue windshield fists oh, yeah, that, the, okay. that would actually collapse in trailer mode. Oh. But but that like the Power Master engine was mm -hmm. so cool. I love yeah, the Headmasters. Big, yeah. But the yeah. problem with the Headmasters is when the head transforms into a robot, you got a headless robot. Right. Power right. Master is you know your robot is a robot, full robot, whether his engine is in or out. So I love that. But um, a couple of people have asked on my Power Master Prime video, how on God's green earth, uh, shout out to Harley Race, who's one of his yes, favorite expressions yes, was on yep. God's green yep. earth. Yep. <laughs> how did you keep the box? How'd you have the foresight as a child mm. to keep, because yeah. I still have my Power Master box. And it's because Power Master Optimus Prime was my second chance. I had the original Prime and took care of it, but I threw the box out because that's what you did. And when Power Master Prime came along, my second chance, not going to happen this time. I'm keeping the box. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping everything. And I took even better care of it than I did my yeah. original Optimus. Yeah. So that was such an awesome experience. I mean, it was a, was it four years? Power Master Optimus Prime was four years after the initial Prime release. Mm -hmm. And as adults, we buy these toys and we get this this time travel feeling mm -hmm. of nostalgia and oh, it's that was amazing to feel that four years after getting the first prime that's what power master prime was it was yeah. like oh my god the magic all over again yeah. he's back yeah. i was just i was excited to have prime you know because i'd never had gotten him the and first so one to actually yeah. a second yeah, so chance to, yeah so to actually have prime was just fantastic and um yeah it, because transformers was one of those lines that you could not Unless you were the rich kid that lived three doors down, you couldn't collect them all. Right. You know, it was an impossibility. I, I had some neighbors that lived right behind us. We lived on a corner, so we had behind the door neighbors and next door neighbors. And the guys that lived behind us, for whatever, somehow, they got like the best stuff, man. They had Omega Supreme, they had Metroplex, they had Trypticon. And so you'd go to play and you'd be like, where's all this stuff? And Oh, I don't know. I lost this. I lost that. And I'm like, what are you doing? How can you just lose? Oh, you, you, this is the <laughs> this greatest is thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Transformers were back in the day? They were the hot toys of their time. They, yes. That's yes. what they were. They were the high-end stuff that mm -hmm. you could have one, 
maybe two right. or three, maybe, but you didn't have a whole, you didn't have the whole release. You didn't have the whole wall of them. They were mm. the high end collectible. Most kids had He-Man or GI Joe right, or Star Wars, but the Transformers was like the, the premium. Yeah. You know, yeah. everyone else was playing with unleaded. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, to how do you exactly. lose, you know, this part or that part? I'm like, this stuff is so precious. Yep. And it's intricate yep. and detailed and take care of it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's it's uh it was it was the, the like you'd see things. I was fortunate enough to get I guess for Christmas. I know I got Megatron one Christmas, I got Jetfire the maybe the next Christmas. Um and I think it's the one Christmas I was given Skylinks. Those were the big ones that I had. The years match up because Megatron mm-hmm. 84, Jetfire 85, Skylinks, Skylinks okay. 86. Yeah. Yeah. I know we still lived in Athens, Georgia when I got Skylinks. So that would have been before Christmas 87. But yeah, so so for that Christmas, I got Skylinks. And then there were a few, you know, I had Swoop as far as Dinobots go. He's the only Dinobot I had. Swoop. I, I didn't have any of the other like vehicle transformers of the, like the, you know, the size of Jazz and Sunfire and those guys. Um, somehow, uh, I stumbled my way into having a Trax at some point. Um, I don't need to run down everything that I ever had as a kid. But, you know, I, it, <laughs> but I just remember, like, all of my Transformers fit in one box, mm-hmm. you know. Um, my G.I. Joes, on the other hand, did not. You know, like, you had to have multiple. And, and, I, and it, I think of that as... In the, in the sense of moving and where I had them kept in my room as a kid and that sort of thing, you know, for, because for me, my toy lines were Star Wars was number one. You know, Star Wars is my first love. Um, then it was probably, as far as just what I love the most, a tie there between He-Man and Transformers and then G.I. Joe. Um those were those were the big four of my childhood, and I think of everyone who grew up in the eighties. Those were the big four. Yeah. But but you know, it, but some kids like GI Joe more than they like Transformers or He Man, and some kids like He Man the most. You know, um, it was just which order you put those things in. Yeah. But, uh, Sa- but same with me. I passed on Star Wars because it was creepy at the time. <laughs> yeah, I just I had I had never seen the movies. I saw clips mm-hmm. on TV, and I. I checked out when I saw Jabba, Bib Fortuna. I saw Vader unmasked at the end of <laughs> oh, Return of yeah. the Jedi on TV. And yeah. I was like, yuck. <laughs> and know? in 2019, Michael Mercy plays Super Nintendo games based on those movies. Ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. I am the biggest Star Wars <laughs> fan now, but I didn't get into Star Wars until everything else died. Wow. <laughs> it died. Wow. And wow. so really? I, I just naturally went from all of my beloved dead franchises to a franchise even deader mm-hmm. than all of the... For all intents and purposes, it was. You're even, right. Even deader, but it had the magic. And yeah. uh, and that was, you know, I've always gravitated towards the, you know, the things that are gone, that have become one with the force and, <laughs> and just kind of appreciating them once the crowd has moved on yeah. to, to the new fad. Speaking, speaking of that, I, here's something I'd like to pick your brain about because I recently, um, maybe it was in your your video where you were unboxing the stuff that the guy had sent you and he had a couple of the, the, the vintage action figures in there. Um, but you mentioned having the silver Hawks, uh, vehicle and, and that the silver Hawks don't quite fit down in, the into garage. the garage. Yeah. Um, it, t- now I really, as a kid dug the silver Hawks. Me too. Um, it, for me, it was silver Hawks over Thundercats you know, every day of the week, I, I just preferred silver, silver Hawks. Um, but it seems like no one, else, like that's one of those things where I feel like as a kid, I was kind of on the fringes, you know, I was just eating up whatever they were feeding me. Um, and I, and I fondly remember, I try not to have two rose colored glasses on about this, this kind of stuff, but I do fondly remember the silver Hawks. I love their theme song. Yeah. You that know, intro. I, I, yeah. I, I just really dug them. I never had any of the action figures or the toys or anything, but it seems to me in in the past year, I've seen a lot of people uh, online talking about the Silverhawks like they were always big fans. And it seems like there's this kind of 
maybe I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but it, to me, there seems to be this kind of mood. It's like, all right, what's the next '80s thing we can go to? Oh, absolutely. Talk about, and and it seems like everyone's kind of honed in on that. I mean, that's just part of being a collector, and I experienced that myself from building this collection. Uh, mm-hmm. It started with, I don't know, I guess it was Transformers and GI Joe, mm-hmm. and then I distinctly remember like He Man. Nah, those those don't really they haven't aged well you know i would see them at collections and like i love them as a kid but Mm -hmm. and i've gone from thinking that to having a giant shelf filled with all the vintage and loving the new super seven vintage you know i've fallen Mm -hmm. back in love with them a lot more than the classics looking stuff Mm -hmm. so uh learn to appreciate that a lot more but silver silver hawks I, i love the cartoon as a kid um, I love the toys. Never had a single one. Just like Centurions and Inhumans right. wanted them. Visionaries wanted yeah. all that stuff so bad. But you gotta you gotta pick your your battles literally. Mm-hmm. You know, and my battle in the late eighties, uh, mid to late eighties, was Joe Transformers and Cops. You know, in terms of oh, like the oh, I didn't cry in a future time. Yeah, in terms of the new line coming out of nowhere and new toys, I was like, eh, I love the Centurion. I love Mask. I love Inhuman. But I went with Cops because Cops was G.I. Joe Black Series, you know? Oh, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> everyone wants a G.I. Joe Black Series. I'd love one, too. But at the same time, I don't, you know, I don't burn for it as much as everyone else does because I feel like I had it in the late mm-hmm. 80s. It was Cops. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Two two series were released, uh, two waves, and they were amazing. And so, yeah, they were. One of the, was one of the Cops related to a Joe? Yeah. That- yeah, che- Checkpoint, I believe, is the grandson of uh, Beachhead. So okay. Larry Hama, on the file card, he he named Checkpoint Wayne Sneed in the third, and Beachhead's okay. final name is no. Wayne Sneed. But getting back into this old stuff, like Thundercats, I think, is fantastic, the cartoon. It, it's really aged well, and I've enjoyed watching a lot of old Thundercats cartoons again on DVD. It's so Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. It, like it just has that lore, that magic, and the code of Thundera. It is just wholesome stuff for your soul. It's like Brave Star, mm-hmm. truth, justice, honor, loyalty. Makes me feel really good every time I watch a Thundercats episode, even if the voice actors read their lines like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they they had their direction because they were told that they believed the audience was of a certain whatever maturity right. level or intelligence sure. or whatever. But if you can get past that, the stories on Thundercats are amazing. The toys LJN need we say more. So LJN it, it's, it's funny because Silverhawks polar opposite. I try to get back into the Silverhawks cartoon mm-hmm. every single time I watch one or get close to finishing one or halfway through one. I just feel like ugh, there's nothing yeah. here. I mean, it's sleek. It's really pretty. It's mm-hmm. glossy. It's flashy. Aesthetically, this is fantastic. I mean, it looks like Thunder. It's by the same people, same voice right. actors, same editing. But why does this just lack all substance? Like, there's mm-hmm. no substance here. And Thundercats has, like, the real, the magic to it, the fun. Mm-hmm. And then you go to the toys, which were made by Kenner, not LJN, and just their little masterpieces right. yeah. As- yeah, aesthetically. And I think that's why we're seeing a resurgence of Thunder uh, of uh, Silverhawks, because aesthetically, they are one of the prettiest 80s toys ever made. That shiny yeah. chrome, which flakes off, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you open a door, the, the <laughs> slight gust of wind. The, from old, the, door. the old vac metalized. Yeah. And, and yeah. then you go to the Mirage, which... You know, so many kids dreamed of having when they were, uh, you know, young and putting the Thundercats in the pods, which could be jacked and they don't fit. I mean, when I finally got the thing like 10 years ago and I I was so excited, first of all, it's sheer terror putting them in there. Because if you've got one in nice condition, you're Mm -hmm. scraping that chrome off by like wedging him in there or her. And they don't fit right. The Canopies don't close right. Bluegrass can't sit in the cockpit without his hat getting smushed. You pretty much have to take it off. It's just really horribly, horribly and, designed. And that's that's such a surprise coming from Kenner because yeah. Kenner, you, you get to their Star Wars stuff, and you know, with the exception of maybe, well, even the even the cloud car pilot could fit into the twin pod cloud car. Okay, his little arm that was a permanent, what I thought was a karate chop pose but um 
you know, was made it a little difficult sometimes. But you would think that Kenner of all people would have gotten that right. Here's what I think. The Mirage was designed for Star Wars sized figures. Mm. There must have been, I don't know if it was two different people, two different teams working on it. If the Mirage was designed before the figures were finalized, I don't know what happened, but, uh, I, I like star Wars size figures would fit in it fine. And mm -hmm. these slightly bigger silver Hawks figures don't like you can wedge them in there, but I just can't see even at that, you know, in that year, I yeah. can't see that being the way they were supposed to fit because yeah, the Star Wars Kenner stuff was perfect. You mm -hmm. know, most of the stuff, you didn't have to wedge things in there. They sat comfortably. Um, and G.I. Joe, everything fit perfectly. It's, it's not like they didn't have the technology to make a figure. <laughs> mask always had headroom. Oh, man. Yeah. Kenner, yeah. right? Kenner mask again. So um, it's weird. I guess maybe Kenner's uh, real Ghostbusters they might have had a little trouble fitting into the Ecto, too. but Yeah, I was a little late. Uh, they, they were a little late on the tree for me as far as getting into the Ghostbusters collecting. Um, and also with Ninja Turtles, I didn't really get into the Ninja Turtles, you know, which were late 80s, right into the 90s, right as I'm becoming a teenager and everything. I would watch the cartoon, yeah. and I got the trading cards, but I never really got into collecting that toy line. I loved uh, I loved the Turtles cartoon. I loved the toys, too. Um, so I, I had all four Turtles. I think I had Krang and Shredder, too. That might have been it. Um, yeah. But the thing that was always a drag about the Ninja Turtles was the articulation. Like, instead of going with the standard um, arm, leg articulation mm -hmm. that every single toy had ever had, they went with that weird thing that Nika uses now. Like, the... The diagonal slice. Yeah, yeah, joint. yeah, yeah. Some Star right. Wars figures have used it Some too. Some Star Wars figures did that, yeah. It's just so weird and it, it doesn't work well. It's so it's so no. silly. And you It's not good if you're wanting to play with like an action kind of situation, you know, yeah. just um either do the the elbow joint or honestly do a He Man kind of thing where you just have a good grip and a and a and an arm with and it's compounded by four. So it's not just, oh, bummer. Oh, Leo, too. Oh, Donatello. Oh, Michelangelo. I, I didn't realize those joints did that back in the day. I, I, I wasn't aware that that, of course, I've never really played with a Ninja Turtle figure either. So they're, they're all the same, pretty much. I mean, there's, there's a little variance there. Like, you know, one of them has the left toe, you know, they're kind of right. on their, you know, the other one has the right one. One of them's both flat footed, that type of little tiny variants but for the most part they're like he-man figures yeah they're all using the same parts right what do you think about articulation you've gone you've run the gamut mm, or gambit mm -hmm. as some texans say <laughs> <laughs> that's a bruce pritchard thing he always says uh run the gambit run the um, gambit i don't think he realizes it's run the gamut <laughs> but um you've gone from the kenner star wars what is it <laughs> five points of articulation five points. yeah to like the vintage collection with yeah everything yep. i mean the nose will like go left and right, right. maybe yeah. <laughs> depending on the character for sure you know if you're near a, a tauntaun Ooh. i thought um i thought kenner or kenner hasbro hit the sweet spot with the power of the jedi line which was between episode one and episode two uh they were released on a green card with like a almost an animated version of obi-wan up in the up in the corner kind of thing and the the sculpts were great. Um, the articulation was just to me in the sweet spot of articulation because you have some shoulder joints that had a good swivel to it. You had um, you know knees that could bend. Um, so important for sitting in vehicles properly. Yeah, right? yeah. You had an you had an imperial officer that could actually put his hands behind his back. Yeah, you know. Um, but uh, but then as they move forward. Well, then they hit episode two, their Attack of the Clones line, and they began to put in all the action features. And and on one hand, it was a it was a cool idea because they're thinking, well, kids are going to get these and want to play with them. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think that was ever really the case. I think that that by and large in the two thousands, most Star Wars toys have been enjoyed by collectors. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish that more kids were enjoying Star Wars toys, but it just doesn't seem like that's the case. Um, Plus, some of those features like were suspect for a kid. I mean, Luke's hand coming off, being severed yeah. by his yeah. father, 
That's, right. That's a cool well, option, but weird. does a kid really? <laughs> <laughs> what was really weird is they were experimenting with magnets in the figure at that time. Yeah, and yeah. so you had either the peg Luke or the magnet Luke, but there was a meaty stump that was left behind when you pulled the hand off. But they did have the little accessory that he has on the Falcon, you know, that goes over yeah, his head. The medical well, thing. I, I'm surprised. <clears throat> These started as a joke and now they're they're actually being released here and there. I remember seeing like Aunt Beru and Uncle Owen skele charred oh, skeletons. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. As, as a, <laughs> that was like a joke. Yeah, yeah. A joke carded figure, and then the Force, which, which is just an empty like bubble or right. or an asteroid. Yep. And these yeah. were like little joke things that people would come up. But I, I'm surprised they didn't do a stump, like Luke's yeah. stump. Luke's stump. Yeah, <laughs> just rattling, stump. rattling around in the card. <laughs> yes, yes, and so they. So they had stuff like that, and that was between that Luke was between episodes two and three. Because remember, there were three years between movies yeah, with the prequel saga collection, I and think. yeah, so you hit that saga collection, and they got back into doing things similar to what was being done in the Power of the Jedi line. But here comes the Revenge of the Sith line, and they go back to a lot of play features. Yeah. And so after Revenge of the Sith, you have some animated stuff that comes and goes and you had, and then that's when they started getting the super articulated stuff, even before the vintage collection came about. And, and in some instances it was almost too much. I like, think so too. You know, when you have, when you have an ankle joint and a toe bend, um, for, for a star Wars figure, they begin to, when they're that small, it begins to, um, compromise the the integrity of the figure to be able to stand properly yeah and and so for display purposes it becomes a little difficult and, and that sort of thing and um and then <laughs> and every then point of articulation about, is another possible break point too it's a, yes like it's I, a break point but it's also a, a, a an aesthetic thing where every point of articulation is another crack in the sculpt yeah it, it, it takes it from being a fun toy to being a bionicle Right. <laughs> Which Bionicle is great, but Bionicle is Bionicle, right? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I, I've been, but here's the thing. The head sculpts on some of those things and yeah. the look and, and the, and, and some of the soft good stuff they did for some of the Jedi and, and different characters and, you know, and I, Boba Fett, you know, is just fantastic in that line. Um, and then when they actually did do the vintage collection, cause they had, as you were, as you recall during the saga collection, they did what they called the original trilogy collection, which were some select vintage figure cards, you know? Um, and they came in the star case and everything. Yeah. Um, and, and I just saw those and I'm like, this is what they should have been doing all along. And then when they actually did the vintage collection, it was a thing of beauty. And I love the idea of like, here is one of the original 99 or whatever it is. And here is something new that was never on a vintage card, you know? And, mm -hmm. and to me, I'm just like, this is, this is the perfect thing you should have been doing all along. Yes. This design, the simple design is so elegant in its simplicity, you know, that you, you, you it's immediately recognizable the the logos are immediately recognizable and maybe i'm just saying that as a 42 year old guy who you know grew up going to the stores and seeing shelves full of star wars figures and and then but it was so wonderful and i tried to get every single one because i loved that concept and that idea and and i wanted to support it unfortunately distribution issues being what they are sometimes with hasbro yeah. um you know, there were a lot that I missed. And if you missed them, then they became this aftermarket thing that was really terrible. But that's off topic. I I think there's a sweet spot between just a simple five points of articulation and the massively articulated three and three quarter inch figure. I, Hasbro, you know, they they swing the pendulum, though. Here's all your super articulation. We're going to swing back this way with this line now. I remember when the when the Force Awakens line came out. And you get them, and it's like, I didn't know how to feel. Yeah. Those <laughs> are the ones with five points again, right? Yeah. I'm like, it's five points of articulation again. I'm like, I like this. I appreciate what they're doing. They are much more stable when you stand them up. Yeah. But after what they've done, could they really go all the way back to just no. five points of articulation? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think so. I thought it didn't work for me. 
Yeah. Um, you know, if, if, um, I had a chance to talk to some of these toy brand managers and maybe some are watching, I don't know. It, it seems hmm. like a few of them are maybe not hmm. the big guys, but I've heard yeah. from a few of the, the oh, smaller wow. companies. Right. Um, so if, if they're listening, the, you know, the one thing I really want to get across is what, what I think motivates the adult collector. It certainly motivates me and it certainly motivates, I would say hundreds of people I've interacted with over the years about this thing. Unfinished business. Mm. That's mm-hmm. what it's all about. Unfinished mm. business. That, uh, original trilogy collection when they would bring out a figure that was never released on vintage card mm-hmm. and then they, they give you a Tarkin and he mm-hmm. may okay he doesn't look like vintage style but it's a Tarkin figure on a vintage style card mm-hmm. we get that feeling of unfinished business finally yep. to go over to G.I. Joe for a second a big lob figure on a card with the explosion artwork that's unfinished business and that feels really good when you get something that never was but should have been. Who uh, now? Who is that? Which figure is that? Big Lob in GI Joe. Who is who is that? From from the movie, he was the basketball player. Big Lob oh, makes okay. his move. Okay. Big Lob. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. they never made a figure of him back in the day, but they did. Uh, the club did uh, made an exclusive. Oh, Hero yeah. was a figure that was supposed to come out in the the dying days of the original He Man Masters of the mm-hmm. Universe Powers of Grey Skull line. A character named Hero, and he had a gold vac metal. Uh, vest and a wand and then they never made them right and super seven just did mm-hmm. unfinished business or another way to put it scratch that itch and that, right. that's yeah. a huge thing let us scratch that itch when hasbro slash kenner whatever name they put on the package putting kenner on there is smart oh it's, wonderful because yeah. it's unfinished yeah. business it's yeah. scratching that itch. ah sure. kenner yeah. that works that's smart um but when they bring out Force Awakens figures that look like vintage Kenner figures, mm-hmm. I don't see that as unfinished business. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't see that as seven, eight, nine, ten year olds going, finally, a Ray figure that looks like a vintage star. It, it's mm-hmm. not happening. I mean, kids might be enjoying it, but they don't have that nostalgia. They don't have that investment. It might be cool for the parents, but I just don't think that's that maximum, you know, I don't impact. I, I, yeah, I agree with you. And I, I also think that there's something in the plastic and something even in the sculpt. Like what I think would be neat for Hasbro to have done with the retro collection line, the little retro line they've done that I don't know how successful or unsuccessful that's been for them. That's they the literally, reissues of the original. Yeah, guys? the reissues of the vintage ones. Um, on the tattered, you know, card. Yeah. The, 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 Why the, did they have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, with, if I get any of those, I'm filling that in with magic marker. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> with those, you know, I think what would have been an interesting thing is to have that line with those original um, reissues, but then have a ray molded the way that she would have been in the 80s. One. You know, one right. figure. Right. Even a chase. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think that would have been a neat concept for them. It would have been something I think would have fired people up yeah. about, well, here's something unique and new. And this Ray now will actually fit on the shelf with Farm Boy Luke or with Jedi Robes Luke kind of thing. How, how about um, this? That's a cool idea with Ray. But how about... Someone from the OT instead. <laughs> like, well, sure. <laughs> sure. I, I know sorry, well, I know they need to tie someone in from the new movies, but I, a part of me is like, eh. <laughs> Well, I was just spitballing off the top of my head. Honestly, I, like the idea. I, love, I would love to see an old Luke in, in a, you know. That would, I think that would be even more appropriate because he's, mm-hmm. he's in the old movies, like an old Han. And yeah, yeah, that, yep. that might be, because then you don't have the baggage of the, you know, the negative people, the haters uh, and, yeah. and, you know, it's an all or nothing mentality with a lot of collectors. And mm. as weird as it might sound, for some people, it might just be, I don't want any of them because I hate that whatever. Right. Ray or Poe or Finn mm. or, or whoever, Phasma mm. figure. I mean, I when I go to Toys R Us and I see the vintage collection hanging on the shelves there, Snoke, 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 Ray, mm. Ray, Jenner, or so Jenner, or so yep. Han Solo Stormtrooper. It's really cool seeing Han Solo Stormtrooper. It's really sad seeing like 40 Rays and Snokes and Jin Ursos just yeah. sitting there clogging. The, it, it reduces the, the 
the fun. <laughs> well, know? like here's here's my here's the way I measure it is we have these second second run stores in the states um, around where I live. One is called Ollie's. I don't know if you guys have Ollie's in Canada yet. No. Um, Ollie's basically is a buyout store. They buy out stuff from these other distributors and things that aren't selling, and then they put it at a very marked down price on their shelves. We have another place that does similar. It's a little not quite as high end as Ollie's called Bargain Hunt. But here's how I kind of realized exactly what's happened with with the Star Wars collection mentality is you can buy the Force Awakens Rogue One stuff in they've got that four pack with Saul Guerrera and different of the figures from Rogue One at Ollie's for like 10 bucks for four action figures and um, I saw some Black Series Jen Ursos at a bargain hunt the other day marked down to like five bucks and it's just like that's not to me, I, I'm not. I love Rogue One, and I love what Rogue One did. Um, it's just an example I see now to say something is not connecting with collectors, and it's definitely not connecting with the kids um, these days. And and so I think Hasbro has been in a spot for years where they've had to decide when it comes to their Star Wars license, do they want to license to collectors, or do they want to license to kids, and and what's going to be the most profitable for them, and. And I really do think that things like Han Solo and Stormtrooper disguise is exactly what you said. It scratches an itch that was never fulfilled back in the day. With with Luke, you had the Luke and Stormtrooper disguise as part of the last 17 or what have you. You never got that Han Solo. Yeah. And now to have that, it fills in a hole. It fills in a gap that felt like it needed to be completed. And rather than, hey, here are... And and unfortunately, it seems to me like those are the ones that get short packed. Though they become the chase figures, well, they become that's that's what know. I thought. But there's about twenty Han Solo oh, really? stormtroopers that have been hanging in my local Toys R Us for about a month now. First I've time I saw them, there was like five of them, and I was like, yeah. I gotta get one. And yeah. and they're easy to find here because okay. they're um in in the states, I believe they're a Target exclusive. So in Canada, they're a okay. Toys R Us exclusive. We don't have oh, Target okay. here, but I'm I'm surprised that they didn't fly off the shelves so yeah, yeah but funny. hasbro has learned i don't know if hasbro is doing this to appease some stockholders and again this gets into part of the business that i don't really understand i don't understand toy distribution i don't know how any of this works but like even with marvel legends which i've dipped my toe back into and again trying to learn I, i've had to pull the reins back on myself especially since getting married last november um congratulations thank you um i i I love Marvel comics. I, I grew up a Marvel kid. And um, and so the Marvel Legends really appealed to me, especially when they do the comic book style figures uh, rather than the, even the MCU figures. And But to go in and see the same thing hanging, it's like they, they have the same issue with Marvel Legends that I've seen them have with Star Wars. And I'm trying to find the toy line that doesn't seem to have that issue because it seems like I'm always seeing the same things where I go. Mm-hmm. And um and and the and the best place to go get stuff is online, such as I don't know, bigbadtoystore.com. dot com. My favorite you know, online toy store. <laughs> I, I love I, I hey, I've learned to love them. You know, they do they send things in a great, safely packaged way and I'm not trying to shill for them for you, but I mean the truth of the matter is, is it's like that's really become the thrill of the hunt seems to be gone, you know, that we all love. And because I don't I don't know where the supply line gets gummed up. I don't know if it's that, hey, we're going to only make so many so we can say we sold out. And then suddenly these things are on the secondary market and you and people want you to pay eighty dollars yeah. for an action figure that was out three months ago. I I don't I can't do that, you know, and and it breaks my heart a little bit. Part part of the fun of toy hunting toy collecting is the thrill of the hunt and you know brick and mortar you go in you hunt you find uh you know oh this they got these new guys in letting people know in your area posting on forums and sightings threads hey get your butt over to the walmart next to the highway they they got them in they got them in right that's just like old days i mean i don't know if you ever did this with any of your friends or family did you ever get a call uh hey steve 85 snake eyes Hid one in the Barbie section. 
Oh, no. or, or Black Never. Luke Skywalker. You'll find wish... him under the RC <laughs> racing Jeep. I wish my friends and I would have thought to do that kind of stuff. I... It was like a G.I. Joe mission because, you yeah. know, you yeah. couldn't find 85 Snake Eyes. It was so no. impossible to find. And well, that, was, that was how you found him. He was tucked away, you know, mm-hmm. nothing illegal going on here. But bought and paid for, you know, it's, yep. it's not shoplifting. It's bought and paid for. It was just kind of like a, on a weird layaway. Yeah, you know, and you, anyone who wanted to venture into the Barbie section, right? You know, to, that's to snake eyes. That's one of the areas when I was a kid that I would always hit when I was going, you know, uh, to look for new toys. I'd go to the Barbie section, and you no, know, a I, friend might be like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm I'm toy hunting." Duke, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I never had snake eyes um, until the 25th anniversary deal came along and i just had to buy him yes unfinished Um, business yeah 25th anniversary of joe was another example of that yeah yeah and uh i remember i was in a department store with my mom we'd gone through the toy section with the understanding i'm not going to get you anything and there was snake eyes and i don't know it would have been snake eyes with timberwolf whichever year that was 85 um so yeah it would have been 85 snake eyes then yeah and man I begged, I pleaded. It was the middle of the year, so I had nothing. I could not say, I'll save it for my birthday. I didn't think about it. Had I been a little bit more mature, I would have said, Mom, here's the deal I'll make with you. You get this today, you can put it away, and I will not ask for it until Christmas Day. Yeah. And and I just didn't. I, you know, I'm kicking myself years down the road for not doing that. But, yeah, Snake Eyes and Quick Kick were the two that I always wanted that I never got my hands on. Man, uh, and I still remember seeing Snake Eyes. Quick Kick was awesome too. Just that kind of martial art mystic. Mm-hmm. You know, every every Joe, most Joes were military, and then you got these mystic guys. Yeah. But Snake Eyes, especially with the black outfit and the white wolf, oh, yes. or gray wolf, it was like yeah. just visually stunning, beautiful. Yeah. You know, amid all of the color and stuff, it worked because everything was so colorful, and you had the one guy without color, Luke well, Skywalker. He was the that, hmm. Snake Eyes was the coolest. Yeah, and and, know, and it, that's why I wanted Luke Skywalker from Return of the Jedi as well. Not even being a Star Wars fan at the time, I wanted that Black Jedi Luke because whenever I would look over to the Star Wars section, you got the colorful Lando and Leia, and uh, the droids are shiny, and everything is just so bright and colorful. And there's that black clad Blast of the Jedi with the green lightsaber. Well, he he wasn't there. He was on the back of the card. And I was like, right. I want that one. He, <laughs> right. Like to this day, when I flip a vintage card or I see a vintage card mm-hmm. uh, online, he's the one that always grabs my attention because he's yeah. just he's like Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's a he's the, you know, um, what is it? A, a backlash to everything that's going on around him. Yeah. 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 He that Luke is one of my favorite figures of all time. Um uh, as far as Star Wars action figures go, but that's because I was such a fan. I was a Luke Skywalker kid, yeah. you know. He he was he was my hero growing up, um, and and I always just I, I gravitated toward Luke even more than Han. I know the cool thing to do is to to be a Han Solo guy, but man, I was a Luke guy all yeah, the way. Me too. And, I, same same with me. I thought Han was cool, but Luke was Luke was just. He was the he was the hero. He was selfless. He was motivated yeah. by all the right things. He was the one. If you follow his example, you're gonna do okay in yeah. life. And here's a cool story for you. Speaking of like getting mom to buy something and put it away for a while, good friend uh, Eric Lutz uh, shared the story with me where um, he had a closet that um, his mom would keep presents in that would be given later on in Christmas. Like she would buy well in advance. Well, she missed one for many, many years. And so one day she was going through the closet and she said, I found this and I I can't remember which figure it was. It might've been Luke, uh, Jedi Luke or or one of the Star Wars figures. Um, But she gave it to him and said, I I bought this for you and and, you know, several years ago, yeah. and it was this mint on card, Shut your mouth. forgotten Star Wars figure. Shut, oh, that's awesome. Which I, he sold or gave away because he, he didn't realize he this didn't. is special and, uh, and he regretted it. <laughs> I, when I was 10 years old, we moved from where my family lived in Athens, Georgia, down to South Georgia, middle of nowhere, little town. 
And one of the things to help soften that blow for me was my mom agreed to give to me my older brother's Death Star play set. Mm -hmm. Uh, My older brother had passed away um, as a child. He had leukemia. I was two years old when he passed away. My earliest memory is being in his room and playing with that Death Star. Uh, I guess playing with the foam is just a little toddler. And he walking in and seeing it and being upset that I was messing with his stuff. Um, I, I've loved Star Wars since before I can remember Star Wars. You know, that's that's kind of my Star Wars story. As, as, a, as a three- and four-year-old kid, I walked around with a blue tackle box full of Empire Strikes Back trading cards. I would just sit there with the trading cards and just look through all the pictures. Um, and, you know, my, my Darth Vader carrying case of, of action figures and and later the chewy bandolier strap with the act with the foam things you could put the action figures into. Yeah. And um, so I got this this Death Star. Loved it. Love absolutely loved it. Had no idea that there was supposed to be a rope um, where the good guys could swing over the bridge. Yeah. Um, did not realize I could never figure out what the little lever for up on the Top Gun was for because all it did was just kind of. Go and bounce back. Go and bounce back. Because, of course, just like all the guns, it was broken. The The actual mechanism had broken off. It was very fragile. Mm-hmm. And and it's supposed to – you pull it and the gun's supposed to pop up um, mm-hmm. as though it's been hit with some battle damage. Uh, but, you know, so as I discovered these things, because there were some support struts that were broken, as many support struts are, and I, to this day have never fixed those or, or bought replacements – um, but as I got into eBay and stuff, as the years rolled on, I began to in, in looking into different Star Wars collections and that sort of thing. I, I learned about the plastic rope and, you know, I learned about the gun supposed to pop up and that sort of thing. Well, I was at my parents' house one day as an adult and my mom had pulled out um, an old footlocker of stuff that belonged to my older brother. And she pulls out this Ziploc baggie. And in it are like three Jawas, you know, uh, none of them vinyl cape, um, but, you know, soft, good capes, but all of them have their weapons. Chewie, Han, Luke, Leia, perfect, you know, cape intact and everything, weapons right there with them all. And then as I'm going through this little baggie, there's this little blue plastic rope. Oh. And uh, and I'm like, do you realize, I looked at my eyes, do you realize um, what we've been sitting on for this for this amount of time is that this, this I said we're not it's not a gold mine I said but this is definitely makes everything worth more and so now I sit here and I'm looking over I, I can't get it on camera but I'm looking at the Death Star playset on top of this shelf and they're dangling right down underneath that top level is that is that rope you know and and it's stuff like that that I look at it I'm like it it makes me happy it's like you said it just it makes you it, it makes you happy and those little stories those moments of of surprise sometimes that come about in collecting or just that's what's addictive about it more than anything. (laughs) It's like found a deal on this, found this at a flea market, you know, snag this thing. And it, and, and that's the magic I think of, of some of this stuff that, that mingles in with that nostalgia. It brings you back to that place as a child. And, and it just, it's a, it's an addictive drug, man. It really is. It really, really is. Well, that's one of my favorite parts about uh, collecting it when I get something that's incomplete and I, I figure, oh, I'll catch those pieces down the road sometime. And doing the channel has opened up this whole avenue that I never imagined, but um, taking the uh, Visionaries Dagger Assault, uh, for yeah. example, which hardly ever shows up on eBay. And when it does, whew, it's up there. So I bought one years ago that was missing a whole bunch of pieces. And, um, uh, you know, a, a good brother named, uh, Tychondrius Fitz messaged me and said, I've got that battering ram front bumper that you're missing. I'm like, e- what? Huh? What? Huh? I was like Han Solo trying to, you know, like, yeah. where, where's what, what, <laughs> you know, like in the, in the Death Star, uh, the ad, yeah. ad lib thing. I was like, what, what, like you can't, you can't buy that thing. You can't find nope. it anywhere. Yeah. It's not right. like it pops up and it's like, I don't want to pay that. It's just not there. They're not yeah. out there. And, and he sent me one. Um, and you know, Mike Smith, I just did a video. He sent me a, a bunch of missing parts, you know, for my battle ram 
and my Cobra Mamba. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's extra special when you put in that missing part and this thing came from, you know, from another country or even halfway across the world. It traveled yeah. this far and it fits it perfectly oh, that's because awesome. it's, yeah. it's like we, it's like a puzzle. It's like we all had this puzzle and I'm missing the top left corner and someone from the other side of the world goes, I've got that top left corner that you need and I don't need it. So here you go. And you put it in. It's just incredible when you've got these things that are very special to us in their own unique way. Mm -hmm. And they're special to everyone in their own unique ways, but they're interchangeable. It's yep. this, it's this puzzle yep. that just works with everything and everyone. It's a great unifier. And that's one thing that I encourage the toy companies, movie companies, TV companies, everybody to try to focus on, to tr focus more on the unification instead of the division. Now in Star Wars, one word, especially after Last Jedi, that's been used a lot is d divisive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's divisive. It's divided the fandom, dividing, dividing. This didn't just happen, you know, wow, who knows why this happened? This is just right. a, a random, no, this, this was bound to happen. This was destined to happen because of the way they've crafted the new movies. They, yeah. they are not unifying. They're divisive. The message has always been, it's about the old crew passing the baton to the new crew. Mm -hmm. That's divisive. That's putting mm -hmm. out one whole segment of your fandom out to pasture. I mean, you're, yeah. That's the message you're giving out. We're putting you out to pasture. Mm -hmm. There's this new stuff that you need to like. Now, they're not, you know, the the old fans, uh, the original fans are welcome to enjoy the new characters. Mm -hmm. But we're invested in the the original characters. You know, we love them. And it's, it's just as hard to have some of your beloved characters put out to pasture as it is to let go of a loved one who passes away. Mm -hmm. It's just human nature. And... That's why I say this wasn't a fluke. This was by design, the divisiveness. Hmm. That's that's how it was going to happen. They could have done it differently. This, they yeah. could, there could have been a lot more unity. It could have been a Luke and Ray story instead of a Ray story, right. special guest star Luke, special right. guest star Han. Well, the whole the whole sequel trilogy as it's turned out, and you got to be careful the minute you start talking Star Wars because it, it really has, it's unfortunate, it has become divisive. I'm okay with the passing of the baton to the next generation. What what we've received by and large is the killing off of the old to make way for the new. Yeah, and and a deconstruction of everything we've loved for so long. When really you don't need to deconstruct Star Wars. Star Wars is myth, and and if you deconstruct myth, then it becomes unmythical you know i mean i don't know of any other any better way it becomes mundane yeah and and i don't know why we would ever reach for mundanity i don't i don't know why we would do that rather than continue to inspire and 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 instill awe in viewers and 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 people who are consuming this material that's one thing that i absolutely have loved about the the marvel cinematic universe over the past 10 years 10 or 11 years when I sat down to watch Avengers Endgame, um, yes, it broke me at, at the end. You know, I was very, I was, I was a man with tears in his eyes. Did you, did you love that movie Three Thousand? I loved it Three Thousand, <laughs> and I loved it because me too. It was, it was as much. Infinity War did everything that it had to do to to be the to be the beginning of the end for this amazing 10 years worth of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And the one thing they never tried to do in these movies was in any of them was, was deconstruct these people and, and tear them down. Yeah. And when you get to end game at the very beginning, you're dealing, you're afraid. I was afraid. I'm like, Oh my gosh, we're going to deal with this. We're going to sit around and talk about the ramifications and, and, and everything, but they didn't, you know, they, they even Thor who you, sort of looks like they're doing the Jake Skywalker thing to mm -hmm. Thor, but right. they didn't because Thor, like very soon after he's, what is he? Bro Thor. They call him now. Lothorsky. 
Thorbowski. Big, the Thorbowski. It's yeah. not too long after we see him at his lowest that he's already his mom's giving him a pet pep talk mm-hmm. and he's got Mjolnir he is well, worthy that, yes that's the moment when he when he reaches his hand out and Mjolnir comes that's not and he, so excited, he says I am worthy I'm still worthy and that moment is what drives him forward into the rest of that plan into the rest of what's going on yeah. so that those three big Avengers round that corner to face down Thanos and the battle begins look I was on the edge of my seat and when Cap gets Mjolnir to me that was everything I was like this is this is why I love these movies I kept hitting my wife saying this is more than I could have ever wanted this is more than I could have ever asked for and it's little it's little tiny moments where Cap doesn't just catch Mjolnir and we go cool they cut to Thor It, it boggles my mind that the company that owns this property and is overseeing a movie like Endgame is also overseeing the Star Wars movies. Mm-hmm. They cut from Cap <laughs> catching it to Thor, who, using wrestling terminology, smashes Cap over by saying, I knew it. Yes. He doesn't go, yes. darn it, or shucks, or give right. me my hammer. He doesn't try right. to cut Cap down. He builds him up. I yeah. knew it. They're friends. They're 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 not. This isn't. A, this is no longer a union of convenience the way it was in the first Avengers. In the original Avengers, they had to come together. Yeah. To 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 face this common threat. In Age of Ultron, they were being divided by the decisions Tony Stark was making, but they still found it a way to come together. Well, when you get here, when you get to this point, these are people who have been through hell and back together. And they are rooting for one another. And the yeah. fact that Thor says, I love that you said that he puts Cap way over. Like he just, he completely puts him over to say, I knew it, you know, because he's just as excited as I am. And he's just as excited as the person next to me is. And 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 again, that's the kind of wonder Star Wars should have had. When yeah. Luke steps out onto the field on, in Last Jedi to face down those those monster adats, I should have had the sense of wonder and awe that I had when Luke tossed aside his lightsaber and said, I'll never join you. I'm a Jedi like my father before me. Yeah. And unfortunately it, it just wasn't there. Uh, you know, they, they had broken Luke down so much that, that, that redemption arc didn't come across as clearly as I think they wanted it to. And, and, and those so are, those are two great moments to actually compare. And I, I don't think it's apples and oranges. I think it's apples and apples or, mm-hmm. or oranges and oranges cap by himself on the field on your left. Oh and my they're God. all there and they're oh. all behind him. And what we're getting at the end of end game, it's, it's brilliant cap. I mean, let's, let's take a step behind the scenes for a second. He's an old character. The, the actor's contract is up. He, mm-hmm. It's the end of the road for him. Let's not invest anything in him. We need to invest in Captain Marvel. That's our mm-hmm. new, you know, big character that we really want to push and all the other new characters. This Cap guy, you know, if it was done by the people doing these Star Wars movies, it, it would have been a very different ending to Endgame. Oh, yeah. It would have been a passing of the baton in, in nice terms, but really a deconstructing, a shaming, an embarrassing in order to try to get, you know, one upsmanship. And and busting cap down to try to get get a shine on someone else. Well, to go back to go back to your wrestling term, they would have buried cap. Yes, to, to put someone else over. Exactly. Yeah. So, but they don't. And cap right till the very fi- he's the final frame of the movie, and he's he's done. He's gone. He do- He literally passes the shield, mm-hmm. and it's done in such yeah. a beautiful way. It takes nothing from cap in wrestling terms. Again, it's right. it's a draw. Right. He doesn't right. do yep. the job. Right. It's a, it's exactly. a draw. And, and he, you know, he's flair putting over the stinger, you mm-hmm. know, at, at that moment where he gives the shield to Falcon is like, yes, he's the perfect guy. And that's the perfect pass off. That's and the I, pass of the baton. Yes. And I've never been really interested in Falcon. Now I am. Oh, wow. They, really? They did it now. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, he's been a cool kind of sidekick to Cap, but mm-hmm. not really an interesting character for me up to this point. I love the idea of Captain America, Sam, Captain America, mm-hmm. like that. They, they smashed him over yeah. for me. We go over to star Wars and I just, I get the, just 
you know, the feeling I get, the, the memory feeling is bickering and no, don't help me. Let me go. Don't, right. you know, it's just constant. Let me do this. I don't need your help. Uh, leave me alone. And this isn't going to devolve into, you know, a feminist discussion, but no, I, no. I, I believe that there are other things going on behind the scenes that are interfering with the way you tell a proper story. And I Star think. Wars didn't invent the story that it told. It it just mm. took the hero's journey. It, right. you know, they put their own spin on it. Yep. These new stories aren't doing, they're not following the path they should because they're like, oh, but make sure that so-and-so comes off really, really strong. Again, to use another wrestling terminology, they're booking it like they've been booking Roman Reigns. That's right. We They're want right. them to look exactly. really, really strong. Exactly. Oh my gosh, you're speaking my language left and right. And, and Luke is CM Punk. Just mm -hmm. going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> but but the one thing, like going back to that divisive thing, <clears throat> one thing that really symbolizes that to me, and this especially, I think, speaks to the collector mentality, because we love the details, right? Many right. of us love the details. We appreciate the details. The dish on the Falcon, mm -hmm. that accursed rectangular dish on the new Falcon. It's the old Falcon that mm -hmm. we know and love, mm -hmm. except that accursed dish. Yeah. So instead of just leaving it off or putting mm -hmm. the same round one, they got to put the rectangular one on to symbolize that it's the new Falcon. Now, it, it mm -hmm. looks just like the old one. It moves. It sounds. It should feel just like the old one. It did in the trailer for me, but now that I've seen a couple of these movies, that dish really represents to me that this is the new movies. You know, we want to sell the new movie. That's our priority, the toys, the merchandise. And the fact that they built a life-size Falcon at Galaxy's Edge and they stuck that dish on it instead of the classic dish. Yeah. The fact that they didn't even use the classic dish in The, in the Force Awakens. Yeah. I think they're not aware that there are... A lot of fans, many of which are collectors, going, oh, that's driving me nuts. Mm -hmm. That dish is driving me nuts. It's like having a figure. It's like having Dusty, G.I. Joe Dusty, and you got everything except that bipod for his rifle. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. nah. it's or a little bit off, yeah. Or it's like having Jedi Luke, and it's not quite missing the lightsaber, but you're missing the blaster. It's like, he right. doesn't yeah. really need it, but yeah i wish it was there yeah i, I agree with you i you know i i was i was someone who came out of the force awakens understanding why people were loving it and wishing that i loved it as much as they did mm -hmm. and not wanting to ruin that for anybody and i saw the force awakens probably seven times in theaters and about the sixth time i saw it i'm like okay i do like this i do like this <laughs> and i did i genuinely liked it and i was genuinely excited for the last jedi and i don't i don't know um that you know it it was it it was divisive and there were there were some great moments you know that i loved and i thought were great but but as i walked out i thought okay well i I, it didn't really do it for me, which is sad for me to say about a Star Wars movie. Um, little did I know what was going to come of fandom. And it's interesting that you point out that, you know, this is almost kind of the uh, a, a plan to be divisive as though they're trying to be what I call trying to be sharp. You know, like if we can, subvert if we can, expectations. yeah, if we can subvert expectations and everything. Then we, then we've done something really cool with, with Star Wars. And I'm I like, some yeah. other people might call it trolling too. Yeah. But, you know, that's the, and you brought up on a recent Toy Guys talking with someone um, uh, talking about Scarlet and how, you know, Scarlet was a, a G.I. Joe figure that you wanted, mm. you know, because she she mattered. She was part of the team. And and this mentality that boys don't want to play with girls, you know, action figures. Kenner produced seven different Lukes. Uh, in the original run, you had Farm Boy Luke, Hoth, Bespin, um, X Wing Pilot Luke, Indoor Luke, and Stormtrooper in Disguise Luke. And I love that you have all those memorized. <laughs> you, well, and they produced, uh, it was either five or six Han Solos because you had a New Hope Han, Bespin Han, Hoth Han, Han and Carbonite, mm -hmm. and Indoor Han. So five Han Solos. Six if you count the one that came with the Slave One. Leia. Five Leia's, uh, A New Hope, Hoth, Bespin, 
indoor bush or bouch or however you want to say that disguise. The point is, is there was no other, there were no other figures that they did multiple versions of outside of R2D2 with his little scope. And then later the, the projectile thing. And, and I guess the C-3PO had them removable limbs, but there were no distinct like super variations on characters the way that they did for those top three. And Leia was right up there. There was a few less, you know, than Luke, two less than Luke and the same amount of her as Han almost. And, and so she, she mattered. I had to have princess Leia, you know, she's one of the stars like, of the movie and it had nothing right. to do with her age or right. her ethnicity or her gender her gender. And as a little boy, as a little boy, I wanted to play with, with princess Leia figures because she belonged in the story. You know, mm. there were, and it's she same was the as, best shot. <laughs> she yeah, was the best yes. shot of all of them. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> you know, into the garbage chute fly. But I loved like she had Take one of my charge. favorite lines of a new hope. Like, someone get this big walking carpet out of my way. Yeah. I always loved that as a kid. I laughed and laughed. I thought that was the funniest thing, you know, she was and, spunky. She was take charge and she also consoled Luke when he was mourning Obi-Wan's loss. She yeah. wasn't, she knew when to pick her spots. Mm -hmm. She didn't mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, get over yourself. You know, he was an old man, you know, right. man up and get the gun turret. No, like she, and even Han was like, Hey, you know, come on kid. We, we've got work to do. Like, right. I like that both of them knew he was down and you don't kick your friends when they're down. Right. But especially like Leia consoling him. That was a very important moment. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, she was a friend. She wasn't just the girl. Uh, right. Figure. Right. You know, and then um, and, and then as you get to Cloud City, you know, as you said, she's one of the best shots. You know, they're running from the stormtroopers and she's taking them out left and right. And then the, the connection with her and Luke and she goes back. We're going back to, you know, what do you mean we're going back? Rawr, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> and I, I never and I guess that's the thing. And and. You know, and I don't know, I can't speak to the experience of, of other people, you know, who are different than me. And, and I would never try to impose upon the experience they've had. But I just know that as a little boy, um, I never thought it was uncool. And none of my friends thought it was uncool to have a Princess Leia action figure. You know, mm -hmm. that we, we wanted Leia in the gang um, because she belonged in the gang, you know, and and we wanted her indoor outfit, you know, from the Ewok village. And we wanted her, uh, celebration robes, you know, from the end of a new hope. And, and there were all these different things that we would have accepted gladly accepted, you know, as you read the comic books, Leia was a part of the Marvel comics, you know, back in the day. And so it's, it's interesting to me, the way that things have gone and, and the way that I look back at my experience growing up with toys. And I'm like, what's being the narrative that's being spoken to me about so many things isn't, wasn't my narrative, you know, yeah. um, to get back to transformers, you know, I, I saw where someone was, uh, there was one of these listicles that people do, you know, and it was like the 10 worst transformer alt modes. And one of them was blur. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I loved blur. I had blur and I loved blur and I loved that character. And, you know, I, I thought he was so funny and cool and, and I'm like, is this, am I alone in these things? And, and does it matter? You know, because I know the happiness that these things brought to me mm -hmm. and the joy that they brought to me and, and, and the good memories that I have of the adventures that I had with these characters through, through these different toys. Um, as you grew up, here's what, here's the sense that I get because I've never heard you actually specifically address it. I get the sense that GI Joe was huge for you, that you were, oh, yeah. that that was, that may have been number one toy line for you was Joe. I, I'd say Joe and Transformers, mm -hmm. uh, on, on TV equally Transformers, yeah. the comic I loved. I, I read quite a bit of Joe too, but the, the Transformers comic, I, I especially love, I would have loved to have more Transformers, but they're just out of my price range. But yeah, those, those right. two, he man, huge too yeah yeah it's, it's i love i loved he-man i love the i love the colorfulness of he-man figures um i haven't had he-man action figures in years and years and years and years but i i do i love them and i know that that's another one where um there are people who kind of make fun of some of the some of the characters from later on mosquito i think is a big one that people like to yeah. kind of joke about and stuff 
But man, I I love those things. And the Horde, the Hordak and the Horde, I love those guys. I thought they were just a great set of villains to tack on to what was already there with Skeletor and Beast Man and Trapjaw and Triclops and Evil Inn. And, um, and and uh, I just and and that's one that's a rabbit hole I'll find myself going down a lot today is just looking through old He-Man figures. I remember that. I had that one. That's one that kind of fires me up to this day. I love the um, blend of the the dark, grim mm-hmm. intensity and also the zaniness. Yes. The, yeah. the fearlessness to be goofy. and Not like just over the top. They, they dance that fine line. But when I was talking to um, Bob Budiansky last week and he was uh, talking to me about how public opinion of his work on the Transformers comics has changed over the years. And when the internet first started, there were a lot of fans who maligned him for Mm -hmm. his, you know, silly stories. His stories were too silly. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that those were people who don't smile. I believe those are people who would open the HasLab Unicron or open the HasLab sail barge like this. So we have the HasLab sail barge in here. It's very big or open Unicron. We have transformed him. You mm. now see he is in planet mode. Mm. Like those are the people who are like, I believe Bob Budiansky's stories were too serious or, you know, too silly. They're too goofy. They're, they're too silly. Uh, that's what I loved about them, that it was a serious situation, a, a war that went on for millions of years. But he include those quips. That's why the Marvel movies are so popular, because mm. it's some serious stuff, man. Half the population of all of existence wiped out. But they still yeah. have time for like quips and jokes Earth and joke banter, again, but they yeah. don't go over the top. You right. Know, it's it's not Superman three. They they found the winning formula, and <laughs> so many of those eighties toys have that winning formula. Now, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's not go. Don't you hate on Superman three, Michael Mercy? <laughs> Superman four. <laughs> Superman four. Oh, I, I don't. Get I, up on I, I, I'm I'm looking at it from the whole thing. Like that's actually an example that I often use. Mm-hmm. Um. Superman one masterpiece yes. in my yeah. opinion. These are all my opinions. Oh, I agree. I know. I know when, you know, when we talk about movies online, that that's when stuff gets yeah. a little sensitive yeah. or fragile. As I like to say, <laughs> people yeah. get a little fragile. Superman one masterpiece, Superman two, pretty good. Yeah. Superman three. What's going on here? Because yeah, yeah. I understand. No, because I get it. I understand. Of Superman and then Superman four. Oh no. And Jaws is actually very similar to the Superman yes, quadrilogy. It is very much similar. Superman yeah. one or Jaws one masterpiece. Jaws two. Hey, I just recently watched it. Really darn good. Yeah. Jaws yeah. three. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> Jaws yeah. four. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I here. Uh, uh, Superman three has well all the all the Chris Reeve Superman very special places in my heart. He's I, great in them. I Superman two to me for years and years and years was the best superhero movie sequel, in my opinion. And ever. have you, and have you seen the Donner cut? I have, I have. Oh, I love it. Now, my favorite thing about the Donner cut is the stuff with jor Yes. Um, it makes, it makes his return so much better, but I got to tell you, general, would you care to step outside is a better line than hadn't you heard of freedom of the press? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love the general, would you care to step outside? But for years, I th- and, and when he comes out of that molecule chamber and now take my hands where eternal allegiance to Zod and he, and you begin to hear the bones crushing and the, and that single trumpet, you know, with just the, with the Superman theme beginning. Oh my gosh. I just love it. Superman three is such a left turn from everything that those first two movies were. And right out of the gate, you know, Clark Kent walking down the street and there's just zaniness happening all over the place. Yep, zany. But but you get to evil Superman splitting in two, and, 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 and he literally, he's fighting for his own soul there in that junkyard, you with, know. With Bizarro, basically. Basically, yes, yes. And then... Not, not a name, but in concept. Right, and then as... As that evil Superman disappears, you know, you get the clear John Williams theme. He pulls the shirt open there. That's a great moment. You know, Superman four, I saw with my dad as a, as a 10 year old kid. And I just loved, I saw Superman three with some friends of the family when it came out. Um, and I have, you know, I was scared of the robot lady 
as a child. Oh, yeah. You know, it kind of freaked me out. Um, but Superman four, I went and saw with my dad, and I remember just like this is cool because it's Superman again. And it wasn't until, you know, I was older that I'm like, oh, this is not a good movie, but the heart is there. Like, like Christopher Reeve really tried to, in co-writing that script, tried to bring back the heart of, of who Superman had been in, in, especially in one and two. And, and so there are, there are dirt encrusted jewels within even Superman four. Um, the fact that he uses the last bit of energy from Krypton to heal himself, you know, and knowing that, nuclear man has the ability to kill him he still goes to do what's right because he's he's flipping superman you know yeah. and the 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 effects are horrible it's the only superman movie where we get to see him change in a phone booth um the the effects are horrible it's the only the, one we see him build a brick wall with his brick wall with building his, with eye my, vision <laughs> these powers coming out of nowhere you know it's like the, put that right up there with the cellophane yes. but but I guess, and again, that's seeing things through the eyes of a child because, you know, the Masters of the Universe movie you know, oh, was out boy. that same year. And it's horrible. It is so bad. <laughs> but but the thought of a, as a kid of like, I've got to see this, you know, and yeah. don't understand what they've done. But I know that they did something. They know what they were doing because I'm a kid and I and I don't know how to make a movie, but they do. So they must have done this right, you know. Yeah. Um, but then, you know. There were just so many things that, honest, honestly, they don't age well. But because of my fondness for them as that child, I, I just I can't bring myself to to dump on them as an adult. He Man, the series, you know, I I have a hard time watching He Man as a grown up. You know, yeah. Um, I I uh, I enjoy it most when I'm doing something else. You know, yeah. like you know, like do you know workout physiotherapy that. That sort of stuff. It's very inspiring to me. Not so much if I'm just sitting on the couch, you know, full mm -hmm. focus and attention. It's, you know, it, it's thin. I mean, and they didn't have much to work with. Right. But what they did have to work with, they did an amazing job with. And, you know, I really enjoy the lessons. It's soul food. And mm -hmm. I enjoy watching it while I'm doing things that are difficult, that are healthy for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, Yes. And because, but see, here's the thing. I've seen people really just trash the He-Man cartoons. I was like, oh, it doesn't hold up. It doesn't. Oh. I'm like, there's no need to trash it. You've loved it as a kid. Yeah. And and it did its job. That cartoon did its job, you know? Um, that's that's just the critic mentality of growing yeah. up watching Simon Cowell every week on TV yeah. and, and I, learning what not to do, you know? Mm -hmm. But but they're doing they're doing what, you know, either him or any other critic, you know, the arms crossing you know, everyone's a critic. That expression has never been more yeah. true than today. Everyone is a is a critic. I've always believed in try to at least be even, you know, mm -hmm. like if you're going to give a criticism, give a compliment to. And in recent years, I, I'm actually tipping that the other way and saying I challenge uh, people to give two compliments for every criticism because mm -hmm. I've just noticed a bit of a pattern and the people who are so e they so easily give a criticism, getting a compliment out of them is like pulling teeth. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's that's a yeah. serious character flaw. And I had a realization last night, and and I know we've been doing this for a while, and so your viewers are probably sick and tired of of me, but I had a realization last night uh, that just brought everything home. Mister Rogers went off the air in August of two thousand one. Um, the where they day stopped. the music died, <laughs> you, you consider, and then and then and then Fred Rogers died in two thousand three. Yeah. In the subsequent fourteen, fifteen, or sixteen years, look how downhill <laughs> things <laughs> gone. I, I am. I very much. Uh, I, I, I'm a. I'm a spiritual person. I have a faith that that I put before everything else and that that informs my philosophy on many many things and i'm convinced that part of the reason so many people have gone sour is just there's a lack of fred rogers in the world um here's Bob a man that, here's a man that told children i like you the way you are you know i i'm 
I'm a fan of who you are. And, and, and I don't know. And now what we're getting told, you're right. It's Simon Cowell now. Who's like, that was awful. That was terrible. And you know, he's doing his job. I get it. But. And, and also the really self-absorbed, um, you know, like the bling and the really, you know, the, I don't even know what their name, Cardassian, Kardashian. That's a Star Trek thing. No, Cardassian. Cardassian is Star Trek. Yeah. Card- yeah. <laughs> well, they suck too, right. <laughs> but, but you know, like the real, you know, it, it all about fashion and, um, status, yeah. uh, over substance, um, you know, yeah, that, the Kardashians. Like, the Kardashians are more Ferengi than they are Cardassian. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Not quite as funny. That's right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. The Better Ferengi change. get away with it because of their sense of humor. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bob Ross is another one. I remember yeah. people were just maligning Bob Ross when I was growing up. You know, this loser with the afro painting. Mm-hmm. He's so lame. And now you don't know what you got till it's gone. And right. Bob Bob Ross is like Mister Rogers. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Canada, we had a, a beautiful, beautiful soul named Mister Dressup, and uh, he was our Mister Rogers. Mm-hmm. And he was just this wonderful man who had a a, a trunk filled with uh, costumes, and he would cosplay before cosplay was cool. And right. he had puppets like Mister Rogers. Yeah, and he taught very valuable lessons. Um, and Fred Penner and uh, the Polkaroo and and you know we had lots of those great kids shows too, and they get made fun of these days when you look back for being cheesy. And I swear, like every time someone tries to break something down to dis uh, just discredit it and dismiss it as cheesy, I go, I love cheese. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm not going to let you dismiss this wonderful thing, and I'm not going to let you soil the good name of cheese. That's right. <laughs> you will not, because <laughs> cheese is awesome. Good day, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had cheese on things, <laughs> especially melted? Melted. It's wonderful. <laughs> Why are uh, we calling yeah. things like that cheesy? Why aren't we calling it muddy or well, you know snotty? <laughs> and now people are, are like, like you said with Bob Ross, I, I, he's one that I always did. I always found the humor in, in what he was doing. And now I've gotten to where it's not an ironic thing that I like watching his stuff. There are days where I'm just stressed that I'll go and turn on a Bob Ross painting. I have, I'm not painting along with him. I'm just listening to his voice, yeah. watching a little happy cloud here. We're going to put a little bit of shredder. It's your world. You do whatever you want. With it. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, man, you're, you know, you know, it'll, it'll calm you down. And, um, it, and I think uh, to go back to what I started this whole conversation with you with, um, that's why people like you, I think are vitally important, not just for the toy collecting community, but for people who would tune in and see what it is you do, whether it's talking Star Trek, whether it's just two guys talking toys or, or, or your toy reviews and, you know, the positivity that you bring to the table and honesty, you know, where it's, it, we've had some honest discussions about things that, that disappoint us, but at the end of the day, it's the, the heart is to drive toward a more positive dialogue, a more positive mindset, a more complimentary, uh, attitude toward fellow man, toward the people that we interact with. And, and that's, what's so important about the positivity you bring to the table and I say keep it up, you know, because you do a fantastic job. And, and um, you know, I love that you've co-opted the term good brother. Um, that, you know. Good, good brother. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, love it. Brother love brother is so used, you know, it's yeah. it's overused and it just lost mm-hmm. the meaning. And when, when I heard those guys start, yeah. good brother, I'm like, that brother. Is, that's an I extra love- little compliment for a person that yep. you care about. That's brilliant. Yeah. I, dude, I want to do this again sometime because we haven't broached wrestling. Absolutely. We haven't. <laughs> we well, haven't, I, uh, I hear that you've got yourself a podcast called Geek Out Loud. I do. I do. Um, right now. Tag everything. me in, good brother. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm happy to have you come on anytime. I've got to get my equipment up and running. It's a miracle that I'm doing this right now. Um, I've got a machine that's being held together by bailing wire and spit right now. And so. Um, the will of the force. But hopefully, it, it, you have no idea. 
hopefully within the next uh, couple of weeks that'll be updated and I can get back on a regular schedule with Geek Out Loud and I'd love to have you on sometime we it, we just everything we've done tonight has been a Geek Out Loud basically I so. love that and we're going to keep chatting after I sign off here I'm just going to give a sign off to the folks watching hope everyone out there enjoyed this if you want to hear some more of Steve Glosson you can check out his podcast Geek Out Loud you're all over the internet mm-hmm Yep, wherever I, wherever podcasts are found, wherever it's there. Stitcher is my preferred, but check that out. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been so awesome Thank chatting you. with you Thank about you. It, man. everything, and I'm looking forward to more. Everyone out there, hope you have a great day, great uh, weekend, great week. Until next time, third mistake. Blow them up. <laughs>